Well, it is a privilege to be here with you again today. I remember our visit here maybe 12 months ago and what a happy Sabbath it was and so glad to be here again with you today. I'd like you to take your Bible into a scripture reading, Revelation chapter 1, verses 1 to 3. Revelation chapter 1, verses 1 to 3. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants things which must shortly take place. And he sent and signified it by his angel to his servant John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, to all things that he saw. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it, for the time is near. October 31, 1517, Martin Luther, an Augustinian monk, nailed his famous 95 Theses on the door of All Saints Church at Wittenberg, Germany. He was protesting against the unbiblical practices and false gospel of the Roman Catholic Church. The event that triggered the protest happened just a year before, in 1516, when the Dominican friar, Johann Stetzel, came to Germany to sell indulgences. He was selling them on behalf of Archbishop of Magdeburg to help pay off 10,000 ducats and also on behalf of Pope Leo X to help pay for the construction of St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. Now, Tetzel was a suave, smooth salesman and he actually had a persuader's spiel. It went something like this. As soon as the money in the coffer rings, the soul from purgatory springs. Recently, my wife, my wife and I were in the UK. We were doing a walking tour of, of the city of Norwich. And I remember the guide asking the question, how was the church able to build these beautiful edifices, which we were admiring? And then she answered the question herself. Along with the general populace, the wealthy merchants with thoughts of future suffering and purgatory dug deep in their pockets to somehow appease God and shorten their time in purgatory. In the preamble to the 95 Theses, Luther called upon his colleagues to debate his protest, and that was the custom of the time. He was expecting no more than that. But instead of engaging in a debate, people printed off copies and soon the document was spread widely throughout Europe. The issue escalated to whether the Pope had authority above scripture to issue such indulgence as been peddled by Tetzel. January 3. 1521, just a few years later, Pope Leo X excommunicated Luther and ordered Charles V, the Emperor of the Holy Roman Emperor, to ban Luther's teachings entirely. Luther was summoned to a, to a trial at Worms in Germany, and in April 1521, he was asked to recant his views on pain of death if he refused. His powerful and courageous response included these words, so familiar, unless I can be instructed and convinced from the Holy Scriptures, my conscience is captive to the word of God, then I cannot recant because it is neither safe or wise to act against conscience. Here I stand. I can do no other. God help me. Amen. This was a fearful and tense time for Luther. 
May 25, Charles V, the emperor, under the duress of the church, declared that Luther was banned and now an outlaw. And anybody could kill him without punishment. They were tough times. 1529, just a little short time after, six princes and leaders of 14 imperial free cities petitioned against the ban. And this became known as the Protestation of Speyer. And following this protestation, followers of the Reformation became known as Protestants. Well, that's a very brief summary. Luther's powerful legacy can be summed up in four points. Number one, salvation is gained by God's grace alone, and the word was solo gratia, and through faith alone, sola fides. The second point, the Bible is solely the infallible and sufficient authority for all matters of faith life and conduct. And the word they proclaimed, sola scripture, Bible alone, scripture alone. And all teachings and traditions to be totally subordinate to the Bible. The third point, all believers are priests and have direct access to Christ alone. And the word was sola Christo, Christ alone without the necessity of, a, of an earthly confessional or a human mediator. And the fourth point, and a very important factor, was a huge impact, the prophetic word, as it gave impetus to the Reformation. The prof prophetic word proclaimed Rome as the Antichrist, portrayed in Bible prophecy. The very power that was undermining solar scriptura with her pagan traditions, and in so doing, destroyed the gospel of Christ. So when you put these four things together, it's a very powerful message, a revolutionary message that's going across Europe at that time. Together, these important truths cannot be underestimated in the impact that they made. This simple statement of truth established a path, now listen to this carefully, they established a path that bypassed the monetary toll road to salvation established by Rome and the state and dominated the Western world for a thousand years, this mercenary path. Now we have a simple set of biblical beliefs the centuries-old enterprise of mercenary powers about to be torn down and, and cast out of a church and out of the palace. The cheating, the deceiving, the medieval facade was stripped away and the evil system was exposed. Revolutionary times. Solar scripture was the foundation the Reformation being firmly planted on the foundation of sola scripture provided naturally for the development of the other sola doctrine, sola fide, sola gratia, sola Christo, all founded on the principle of sola scripture, the word of God. The Reformers understood this. So before the arrayed authorities of church and state, Luther stood on the doctrine of sola scriptura, scripture alone. And when asked to recant, he concluded his defense with the word, my conscience is bound captive to the word of God. I cannot and I will not recant. Here I stand, I can do no other. Can you just imagine the scene? All the powerful people of Europe would bear hearing these words. One very important emphasis to note at this juncture is that the Bible isn't the only word of God. Christ is the ultimate word of God. He is the truth. He is the message. 
And according to scripture, the sword of his mouth is the word of God. And this was the only weapon, the sword of his mouth, the word of God, this was the only weapon that reformers had as they waged warfare against the biblical traditions of the Church of Rome and the centuries of religio-political correctness that together had become an awful scourge and led Europe into 1,200 years of satanic darkness. The wonderful good news of righteousness by faith in Jesus alone was like a new creation. When God in the beginning said there was darkness, let there be light. Now, through the precious sacrifice of the cross, the wonderful good news of the gospel, through the precious blood of Jesus with his covering righteousness, people were hearing for the first time for a thousand years that Jesus is an all-sufficient saviour. The impact was enormous. For much of Europe, it was like the dawning of a new age of unspeakable joy and blessing, something to even die for. Truly, the light had come and the darkness had been dispelled. It was a new creation. Now, I want to just hurry up forward a little bit in time. I want to bring you down to a time of John Wesley, the conversion of John Wesley. John Wesley's conversion was a direct result of the writings of Martin Luther and the preaching of Martin Luther. But not only Luther. And Luther also had been influenced by those who had gone before. And I just want to give two names. John Wycliffe in England, a hundred years before the time of Luther. He was often known as the morning star of the Reformation. And at the same time, contemporaneously with him was John Huss in Moravia, which today is Prague, uh, city of Prague, uh, Czech Republic. He was teaching at the university there. Now, John Wycliffe was the first to put the actual scriptures into the language of the people, all copied by hand, no printing presses. John Huss was so influenced by the preaching and teaching of Wycliffe and his reaction to the, to the terrible darkness of the times. Incidentally, there are three popes contemporaneously all claim to be popes at this time and they are suffering under the duress of three of them. And John Huss picked up the message of Wycliffe and began to herald it there in Moravia, the Czech Republic as we know it today. For that, he was burned at the stake. Now these two men had a powerful influence that filtered down to the time of Luther. And the result is that Luther was reacting to exactly the same things that Wycliffe and Huss had been reacting to. Exactly the same. Going through the same kind of trials and ordeals and persecution. Now, the descendants, the followers of, of John Huss, were often called or referred to as the Moravians. And the Moravians, as faithful followers of Huss, dispersed across Europe, even to England, preaching and proclaiming the true gospel of Jesus Christ and the great truth of Sola Scriptura. Uh, they're great missionaries. And John Wesley was influenced by them also as he was by Luther. So when you put the picture together, it's a powerful picture, and there's many others we could mention. Wesley, like Luther before him, trusted in his good works for salvation. He was almost in despair. And when death stared him in the face, he was fearful and found little comfort in his religion. He confessed to his growing misery to Peter Bowler, a Moravian friend, a German, a missionary in UK. And he confessed to Peter Bowler that he was thinking of giving up the ministry. And Peter Bowler said, don't give up, but preach faith until you have it, and when you have it, you'll be able to preach it to others. Just a few days later, John Wesley was riding in a car with a prisoner going to his trial. 
where he decided to follow the advice of Peter Bowler. And so he preached to the prisoner faith in Jesus Christ for forgiveness of sins. And the amazing thing was the prisoner immediately responded and was converted. John Wesley was utterly astonished. Whereas he had been struggling for years and trusting in his good work to try and find forgiveness and peace and heaven, this man finds it instantly. Blew his mind. He went back and studied the New Testament. And he discovered that this was the pattern. In fact, the longest time it took for a person to gain understanding and conversion and forgiveness was only three days. And there was the Apostle Paul, remember in Damascus, waited three days for the prophet to come to him. And there he was baptized. Wesley, years, trying to find it. This just, this just completely revolutionized his thinking. John found himself crying, Lord, help my unbelief. In the evening of May 24, 1738, he reluctantly attended a Moravian society, a Moravian society meeting in Eldersgate, London. Someone was reading Luther's preface to the Epistle of Romans. And it goes something like this. On account of Christ, faith is a divine work in us. Faith is a living, daring confidence in God's grace. So sure and certain a man can stake his life on it a thousand times. The righteousness that comes by faith is God's righteousness. A gift for the sake of Christ, our mediator. As Wesley listened to these wonderful words of Luther, about 8.45 p.m., he said, I felt a strange change come into my life. My heart was strangely warmed. I felt I did trust Christ, Christ alone for salvation, and an assurance was given to me that he had taken away my sins, even mine, and saved me from the law of sin and death. It took Wesley a little time to work out that salvation is not Christ plus good works, but Christ alone. And such salvation results, however, in good works. Now Wesley became a powerful preacher across the whole country of England and beyond into Europe and to America as well. It was a turning point in England. Even as Luther proclaiming and those with him was a turning point in Europe. He travelled on horseback as much as 20,000 miles a year proclaiming the gospel to all who would listen. And wherever he preached, lives were changed and, and manners and morals altered for the better of society. Many believe, with good reason, that his preaching spared England from the terrible ravages of the French Revolution that occurred a little later, as, as the people of France reacted to the traditions and, and false deceit of the teachings of Rome. The powerful legacy of Luther, Wycliffe, Huss, Jerome, and so many others changed the whole history of Europe and the Western world based on sola scriptura. Sadly, there was another legacy that was so disappointing to the other reformers. Just as at Wittenberg, where the fires of the Reformation were first kindled, so it was at Wittenberg that the fires began to fade and die. What was happening? It was at Wittenberg where Sola Scripture was announced, and it was Wittenberg where Sola Scripture began to be compromised. And the Reformation began to slow down. Now, while the Protestant reformers, on the basis of Sola Scripture, believed all the major teachings of Rome were unbiblical, Luther, unfortunately, for various reasons and several areas of biblical truth seriously compromised the principle of solar scripture. That in turn divided the united voices of the Reformation across Europe. 
The devil doesn't give up easily, does he? I just want to mention four areas of compromise, religio-political compromise on the principles of Sola Scriptura. First of all, the issue between law and grace. Luther struggled with the book of James. He, he found it difficult to reconcile James with the, with the writings of the Apostle Paul. In his anxiety to stress justification by faith, he found it difficult to see how obedience to the law really fit in. He, he kind of separated completely. His emphasis on good works and obedience to the commandments of God and James kind of, Luther struggled to, to, to comply with, to understand it. As late as 1542, he insisted here in Wittenberg, we have cast James out of theology. Indeed, we've almost thrown him out of the Bible. Now he did mature a little later in his later years about this, but this was a, a huge impact a negative impact on the Reformation. The tragic legacy, it led to a conflict in the relation between law and grace that later, later gave rise to antinomianism which to increasingly divide continental Protestantism. That's number one. Number two, the celebration of the Mass. Based on Sola Scriptura, and the inevitable teaching of solo gratia and solo fide and solo Christo, the mass didn't stand up at all. It was a false gospel, a mass denial, if you like, of the whole benefits and teachings of the cross. It was an awful denial of the, of the all-sufficient death of Jesus on Calvary. That his sacrifice was not sufficient, you needed something more. That was a mass is about. And only the church could give you that something more. The, the impact on this issue was, was powerful on the minds of many. I haven't time to explain how the whole matter finally was resolved, but I can tell you that it was right there in Wittenberg at Wycliffe before and John Huss before began to give the bread and the wine to all worshippers as a symbol and memorial of the death, burial and resurrection of Jesus. Totally different to the Mass. Luther visited back to Wittenberg when this was happening. In fact, Philip Melanchthon was one of the first to do it in Wittenberg. And when Luther visited back on a secret visit from his Heidi Place in Wartburg, he said he was well pleased with what he saw. But a little later he changed his mind. And I haven't got time to go into the reasons why he changed his mind. But Luther, for religious and political reasons, changed his mind and took a compromised position which he called consubstantiation. Now, the Mass is based on the theology of transubstantiation, where the bread and the wine actually changed into the body and blood of Christ, literally. He compromised and said, no, I'm not going to accept what the other reformers are saying. So he, 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 he kind of compromised the whole thing. And he elevated the Mass again with the host in his worship program. The tragedy of all this was, it was a huge compromisation of the Gospel as well as well as contrary to Sola Scriptura. The sad legacy was it weakened again further the Protestant Reformation. It divided it. Sola Scriptura and believers' baptism by immersion was the third point of compromise. Both Luther and Zwingli at first appeared to accept believers' baptism by immersion as they preached, as, well, as preached by the reformers generally in place of the tradition of Rome of infant sprinkling, uh, child baptism as it was called. But then for religio-political reasons, 
political correctness, they changed, both changed their minds and denied the powerful symbolism of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus as taught in the symbols, or as taught in, in, by baptism. The whole issue was so complicated. It had to do with the relationship between church and state. That itself is another subject. But it was an enormous issue. And Zwingli and Luther compromised. And they took a strong stand against baptism by immersion. And they mockingly called those who were baptized by immersion as Anabaptists, which simply means rebaptizers. But in so doing, they were undermining sola scriptura. Now, the tragedy is this that at this time, some of the most terrible persecution broke out across Europe. Protestant and Catholic together opposing baptism by immersion, and thousands, literally thousands, were persecuted. Some burned at the stake, but most by drowning. And it was called, mockingly, the third baptism. The fourth point of compromise was the Sabbath and Sola Scriptura. July 1519, Martin Luther was debating Dr. Eck. Now, Dr. Eck was a staunch defender of the Catholic Church and its traditions. And he challenged Martin Luther to the debate. And during the course of the debate, as both men looked each other in the eye, they also had an eye for the audience that was listening. Finally, came to the conclusion of their debate. Martin Luther concluded his debate based on solar scripture by essentially saying this, Dr. Eck doesn't know a thing about scripture and isn't willing to listen to anything from scripture. That is basically his summary. But Dr. Eck and refutation was devastating. He rendered Luther almost speechless. And many ultimately believed that caused him to lose the debate. Now, some of you would have seen the film of Martin Luther, I'm sure. You'll never see this in the film, but this is the truth. And what X said in his summary, also as I to the audience, is a matter of historical record. This is what he said. Look in Martin Luther in the eye. If you turn from the church, to the scriptures alone, sola scripture, then you must keep the Sabbath with the Jews. He could have easily added, along with Christ and the apostles. And he finished by saying, which had been kept since the world began. Martin Luther was accusing the church by its many traditions and false gospel and in doing so had exalted itself above the scriptures. But X pointed argument was if you really want to live by sola scriptura, then you need to return to the Sabbath of scripture. Powerful argument. I have to tell you this, that at this point of time, particularly amongst the Anabaptists, the Sabbath was becoming quite a widespread truth throughout Europe. In fact, many historians believe that if it had not been for the combined opposition of both Catholic and Protestant, it could have become the prevailing doctrine of acceptance across Europe. Luther added his voice powerfully against it. So consequently, the Sabbath truth became his Achilles heel, you might say. Now, I want to fast forward again not too far forward, to 1545, to the Council of Trent. The Council of Trent was a, a reaction to the Reformation. And it lasted for 18 years, 1545 to 1563. Long, weary years. Why did it last so long? 
the impact of solar scripture had stripped the church of many lands of wealth. Half the bureau had turned away from, the, from her false gospel and her many unbiblical traditions and dogmas. Rome knew she stood guilty, vulnerable, before the powerful voice of scripture alone. She knew that and was desperate to find an answer. And within the council, there was a growing mood by many to declare in favor of sola scripture. Can you imagine that? Within the council itself. In fact, the Pope's legate actually wrote him stating, there is a strong tendency to set aside tradition altogether and make the scripture the sole standard of appeal. That was the mood. Eventually, everything had came to a standstill. And at that point, Archbishop of Reggio, that's the city of in southern Italy, no doubt remembered Dr. Dr. X challenge to Luther, turned the council against the Reformation with his argument. His argument, the Protestants claimed to stand by the written word only. They professed to hold to the scriptures alone as a standard of faith. Now their profession of holding to the scriptures alone as a standard of faith is false. Proof. The written word explicitly enjoins the observance of a seventh day Sabbath. If they truly hold to the scriptures alone, they would be observing the seventh day as enjoined throughout, as it's enjoined throughout scripture. They not only reject the observance of the Sabbath enjoined in the written word, they have adopted and practiced the observance of Sunday for which they only have the tradition of Rome. Powerful argument. To put this in context, as I said, the Sabbath was now quite widely been observed throughout Europe, bitterly opposed by both Protestant and Catholic authorities, Luther's voice amongst them. The bishop knew this. He knew this. And with this argument, the council stood together. They dropped any sympathy to the idea of solar scripture alone. The legacy of denying the biblical Sabbath, I want to say this very carefully, the legacy of denying the biblical Sabbath gave birth to the terrible Catholic counter-reformation. The founding of the desperate Jesuit movement, the unspeakable evils of the Inquisition, the terrible 300 years of religious war leading to the darkest period in Europe's history, where millions of martyrs were persecuted. Remember, it was her boastful exaltation over the Sabbath truth that gave her the unseemly and satanic power of the hearts and the mind of the masses, leading to the darkest era in European history. Now that puts the Sabbath in a powerful context, doesn't it? Think about it. By holding to sola scriptura, the reformers had dealt a, a death blow to the papacy, hence the Council of Trent. By compromising scripture and clinging to Sunday and other papal traditions, they denied solar scripture and lost the battle. They bound up the deadly wound by denying the biblical Sabbath ordained by the creator himself. Twenty seventeen, five hundred years later, what can we observe and learn from all this? What has happened to the brave, courageous Protestant voice of Sola Scriptura that gave birth to the Reformation? Today, we are faced with many religio-political correct compromises just as serious as in Reformation times. Religious compromises and political correctness would together totally ignore, undermine the voice of God in Scripture. 
that openly reject the moral law of God, that mock the faith and teachings of Jesus. Listen to Jesus himself speaking to John on Patmos. It, it's, a, it's a wake up call, it's a warning. When he said to John, right at the end of time, and the dragon was angry with the woman and went to make war against those who keep the commandments of God and the testimony of Jesus. The testimony of Jesus is the word of God. There was a warning. But listen again to the words of Jesus, again from heaven to John. This time it's a verdict, heavenly verdict. Listen to it. Look, here are those who keep the commandments of God, and what else do they keep? The faith of Jesus. These two messages, a warning and a verdict, embrace, if you like, the whole message of sola scriptura. In summary form, the commandments of God and the testimony or the faith of Jesus is what this book's all about. How wonderfully significant that the first table of the ten words focus on the worship of the Creator, the Creator God from Sabbath to Sabbath. The second table, beginning with the fifth commandment, focuses where? On the mother and the father, the family. Aha, does that trigger something in your mind? The fifth, fourth command, fifth commandment identifies a father and a mother of what is a marriage and the children as part of the family and the five remaining laws define, preserve the well-being and life of the family. I used to think, and I certainly preached this way for many years, that the attack against the commandments of God had to do with the first table, the first four commandments. The first four commandments that define God, who he is, the creator, the one who made the Sabbath, the man who made the world. And this is how it was in Reformation times. This attack was seen as the first, against the first four commandments. But today it is much bigger. And Jesus, in his warning to the end of time, saw it so. The attack is against the commandments of God that now involve the whole law of God, the second table as well. It is no longer considered by many to be politically correct, to be gender specific about children or even fathers and mothers. They are being disenfranchised. The idea of religious and political correctness has compromised utterly the word of God. There is a drive to name parents no longer a mother and a father, parent one, parent two, on birth certificates. Has the world gone mad? The sheer hostility of a dominating Marxist left against anybody who opposed their ideology are mocked, savaged, even assaulted, persecuted, and threatened. They openly blaspheme, and that's a descriptive word for the book of Revelation itself, they openly blaspheme, ridicule the Bible and the name of Jesus, the faith of Jesus. They deride his words when the Creator said, from the beginning he made them male and female. But listen, he made them male and female in the image of God. That's a stamp. And when he wrote the fifth commandment, a little later on, he was gently explicit, father and mother. I'm hurrying through what I have here, but it's I want to get to what, you, what I really want to say. Religio-political correctness, shamefully involving churches and many politicians, along with the shameless media, is an open assault against sola scriptura and the faith of Jesus. 
and the holy law written by his own hand, reverently called in scripture, the work of God. Let me turn your minds to how John, in the end of time, placed a total focus or saw a total focus on the word of God. In fact, in the book of Revelation, the word of God, the commandment and the faith of Jesus are mentioned about as many times as there are chapters in the book. That's a powerful emphasis, isn't it? On the word of God. Revelation 1-2, I read the opening verse to you. He sent his angel who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus. Revelation 12, the saints overcame through the blood of the Lamb and through their faithful testimony to the word of God. Now this is the kind of language you see throughout the book of Revelation. Here are they that keep the commandment of God and keep the faith of Jesus. That's the emphasis over and over again. Blessed are those who do the commandments they might have right to the tree of life and enter through the gates into the city. These are the words of Jesus to John, who was the living word, who spoke the word, and whom the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we be a whole his glory, the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Revelation chapter 19, verse 11 and 13. Perhaps we could turn to this. Revelation, the 19th chapter. <clears throat> chapter 19 of Revelation, verses 11 and 13. Now I saw heaven opened, and behold a white horse, and he who sat on him was called Faithful and True. And in, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like the flames of fire, and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood. And his name is called, what is it? The Word of God. He had on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. What is the significance? What is the significance of Jesus coming in glory with this name, the Word of God? Nowhere else in scripture do you see this kind of emphasis as you see it in Revelation. And finally it is coming in glory. He comes and his name is the word of God. Does it not remind you that he is the eternal world who spoke the world into existence? Does it not remind us that he is the eternal word that was made flesh and dwelt among us? Does not his robe dipped in blood Remind us that he alone is able to blot out his sin through his precious blood forever. That he alone is the absolute word for forgiveness and the wonderful assurance of righteousness by faith. He alone. Robe dipped in blood. Does it not remind that he is coming to those who have lived faithful and true to the word of God? Who have kept the faith of Jesus? Does it not remind us that the sword of his mouth, which is the word of God, which goes out shall judge the nations because they have rejected the word of God? Does not the many crowns, or do not the many crowns on his head and the universal title, King of Kings and, and Lord of Lords, proclaim that Jesus and Jesus alone, Christor, Sola Christor, is the eternal, triumphant word of God. And that he shall reign forever and ever. And the saints shall reign with him.
Thank you, Jesus. What do you say? I think it's time to worship him, don't you?